Welcome to today's program, a post-election post-mortem, assessing how traditional and new media outlets responded to the problem of misinformation during the elections and part of our new Meridian Global Journalism Initiative. I'm Megan Beyer, a board member here at Meridian. I started my career as a journalist covering politics before America did away with the Fairness Doctrine. As a local reporter, I remember using every possible measure to ensure objectivity and even handedness in reporting. That came down to counting the seconds of sound bites for positions pro and con. It wasn't a perfect uh, way to do it by a long shot, but it did mean that we were constantly aware that objectivity and veracity were imperative that our role and our duty in our democracy was to inform the public and to put a finer point on it, to inform the electorate. But those laws ended up off the books by the end of the 80s. It is, in the, it is the position of Meridian International that ethical journalism plays an essential role in connecting the world through truthfulness, accuracy, and transparency. For nearly two decades, Meridian has designed programming to provide journalists access to the diplomatic core, curating events to create understanding, insights, and cultural context for more effective international reporting. Our new journalism initiative is an extension and amplification of those efforts at an important time for our democracy. Effective fact-based journalism is literally a life and death imperative in an era of international pandemic and economic crisis. Yet the fourth estate in America has never been so challenged, challenged by undermining social media networks and even new mainstream media networks spreading false conspiracy theories, fact-free reporting, and even violence advocating messages. Some political leaders routinely brand reporters as enemies of the people. The irony holds democratic freedoms expose us to threats. With this as context, we invite you to spend the next hour contemplating the state of global democracies in an environment that has seen decades of growing involvement by social media players. Today, we'll hear from a panel of experts who will share their considerable expertise from decades in journalism, tech, and policy. The program is on the record. It is being live streamed. We're honored to be joined by a tremendous audience today, and we hope that you will all contribute your questions and thoughts using the Q&A portal. Leading us in conversation today is Joey Chen, who you'll recognize from her time at CNN, CBS, and Al Jazeera. Joey currently serves as senior advisor and faculty at the Pointer Institute, which bolsters journalists and enables citizens to participate in a healthy democracy. Pointer's work includes PolitiFact and the International Fact-Checking Network. As you can imagine, They've been incredibly busy during this election cycle. Joey, we're so pleased to have you facilitating the discussion today at Meridian, and I'll turn it over to you now. Megan, thank you so much. That is a great introduction and a great reminder to all of us about the drama that we've seen in this year and also our attempts to work through that to bring facts and information to the people who need it. I thank you, Megan Beyer, as well as the Meridian Global Journalism Initiative for convening this event. The title is a big one, Misinformation and the Media, a post-election debrief, quite a bit. We do have great voices for this conversation. And as Megan pointed out, we want it to be a conversation. We want you to join us in the chat and bring your questions right up front as soon as you think of them. We want you to have an opportunity to speak directly to, or at least digitally directly to Ben Smith, who is the New York Times media columnist. You'll recognize his byline from that publication, but you also may know him as the founding editor-in-chief of BuzzFeed News. He also had previous stops at Politico and New York Daily News, New York Sun. I know him best by following him as Ben YT on Twitter. And Ben will ask you to bring your visual up as well. Yale Eisenstadt is also with us. 
And Yael, uh, I just want to point out that one of the inherent weaknesses of TV people is we always try to put people in a little box or at least a line underneath their name. You would be a television producer's nightmare because you have been quite a bit of everything already in your career. Former CIA analyst, diplomat, you previously served as national security advisor at the very top levels, including to President-elect Joe Biden. Um, and somehow this all led you to a role at Facebook as global head of elections integrity. Today, Yale is a visiting professor at Cornell. She is highly quoted on this intersection of democracy, social media, and technology. And I ask if she doesn't get to all the points today, I ask you all to look at her uh, TED talk because it's really quite interesting about her experience at Facebook. But uh, as Megan said, I am pleased to join you from the Pointer Institute. We are in the business of supporting journalists, speech, and democracy. And so we are very pleased to be part of this program today. All right, guys, let's just start on the big takeaways about the media role um, in this election cycle and in the aftermath. We got, I think, 55 or 56 days left until a new administration. Ben, let's start with that. Just um, your, your big takeaways on this election. Were there surprises to you? Did the media handle it well? Um, I mean, I think, you know, the, the media always goes into these things determined not to make the same mistake as last time and very sort of invested in what happened last time. And I think, you know, you saw sometimes that created its own mistakes. I think, you know, there was this moment when the New York Post published this kind of weirdly sourced article about, about Joe Biden's son. And a lot of the media and Twitter in particular, like was so ready for WikiLeaks for like a foreign sponsored hacking operation. And they like put, they like ran the WikiLeaks playbook and like blocked links to this New York Post article. And really it was kind of a weird shady New York Post article that the rest of the media was like just fine handling. Thank you. We didn't need tech platforms coming in and blocking it. Like it wasn't, it just wasn't the thing they anticipated. So I think there were moments when, I don't know, people sort of overlearned the lessons of the last cycle, but I think the main new challenge actually was, um, was the kind of conduct of the election itself. It's not something the media typically covers, partly because it's the media basically runs the election, you know, hmm. machinery. The media declares a victory. The media puts on this show. There's a sense that the media itself administers the election in this strange way in this country. And, um, and so I think, but I, and I think actually the media did a reasonably good job toward the end of saying, hey, this could take a while. It's normal for it to take a long time to count votes. Um, you know, this is true, this is false, these claims are false. Um, and I, you know, could it could have done better? The media is a lot of different things and means a lot of different things. I think social media platforms, I mean, Facebook in particular, after initially actually, I think, dampening the spread of a lot of crazy election misinformation has since kind of just let it run totally rampant. And the consequences of that, Yale, yeah, um, just the, the, I guess, public floggings of the leaders of the social media platforms at the Senate, and that I guess you would probably say well-deserved, but give us your take on sort of this election cycle and what, it, what you saw in it. Even in the midst of people saying, well, we would like greater election integrity on the social media platforms, what actually happened? Sure. Thanks, Jerry. Um, I'll just focus on social media since I uh, haven't worked in a mainstream media outlet myself. Um, so listen, similar to what Ben said, Facebook and Twitter absolutely did not want to make the same mistakes that they made in 2016. Um, and so, yes, they instituted all these different sort of stopgap band-aid type measures um, ahead of the election much of which I just wanna be really clear, they did a little bit kicking and screaming. Let's be clear, it was academics, journalists, you know, activists, some employees who pushed really hard to get them to agree to make some of these changes. Um, but it just, judging them depends on what it is you're judging them on. Did they do a good job making sure that Russians couldn't buy political ads paying in rubles? Or did they do a good job uh, working a little bit more closely with the US government to combat foreign interference? Absolutely. Did they do a good job at helping ensure that we didn't get to a place where any lie by a politician or a politician surrogates or a small group of coordinated individuals, especially domestically, could spread 
exponentially and continue to undermine the trust in the process, I, I wouldn't say they did such a great job at that. Um, and, and I'll go into as much or little detail as you want throughout the conversation, but um, at the end- I am struck by this because you both have made reference to the edge of this, you know, the, the, there was a certain expectation. I think everybody was looking over here, where is the, where's the foreign interference going to be in this election, everybody was sort of, I mean, legacy, new media, whatever you want to call it, everybody was sort of pointed at the, what are the external things? Because that's what happened in 2016. And yet the reality was whatever misinformation seems to have come from a more um, domestically present bad players. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're right. It's it's you know I've been I was saying this for the last year and a half that they seem to be preparing for the election of 2016 as opposed to the election of 2020. Right. Uh, and I'll just say quickly for me it's it's a I care more about the larger systemic issues of why these platforms are contributing to an information ecosystem where hate speech, misinformation, salacious content wins the day as opposed to every single little piece of content if they made the right or wrong choice in terms of whether they should fact check it or not. And that's a conversation now that we're past the election that I hope people start having. But um, yeah, they they were, they were they learned from 2016. They, I, I mean, I was part of the team for a short while that put in some of the, the new stopgap measures on political advertising. But again, for the last four years, they have allowed certain actors in the US to use their platforms to spread so much division and disinformation and misinformation without any checks on them that there was no way that one or two months before the election, they were suddenly going to figure out how to rein that all in and, and make people trust the process again. Ben, can you speak to this a little bit? I mean, you've talked about the gatekeepers and sort of more legacy traditional approaches to gatekeeping sort of reemerged this time around. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that happened in 2016 was that there was a impression probably encouraged by me when I was at BuzzFeed that the um, that places like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and CNN were kind of like, had kind of like lost their ability to shape the story and the best they could do was keep up with us on telling you what was already on the internet. Um, so it was sort of throw and, up your hands. We can't do yeah, anything about and I, this. And I think that one of the things that became clear after that election was actually that the Times' decision to sort of amplify and play really, really high stories about Hillary Clinton's emails. Like, by the way, along with the decision of the director of the FBI to do that, probably more the decision of the director of the FBI. I and mean, these things are complicated. People, some, I think people often overstate the role of the media, by the way. But um, the, you know, that had a huge impact. And that like, seeing something on Breitbart is different from seeing something in the New York Times, even for a Breitbart audience member or for a swing voter. And, and I think they've, and I think partly because Trump never had any doubts about that for a second and was obsessed with getting things in the New York Times and on CNN, um, in a weird way, like he gave these outlets their confidence back. I think people were like, oh wow, if like Donald Trump is this obsessed with us, we must still be relevant, um, which was very frustrating when I was at BuzzFeed. Um, but so, I think they, in a strange way, like Trump reminded the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN of their ability to shape the narrative, their ability to decide what's news and what's not news. And um, and I think particularly in the waning days of the election, there was one very, very kind of vivid instance where the Trump people kind of came flying into the Wall Street Journal with a like three quarters baked story about Hunter Biden, which was I think largely an accurate story in the sense that like they had real documents and it wasn't some foreign plot, but it, didn't, the documents just didn't say what they said they said. And the Wall Street Journal looked at it really, really hard and finally said, you know, we don't really think there's a story here. Um, and, you know, that it takes a certain amount of self-confidence to do that. Yeah, you, um, you have written about that particular incident and sort of the backgrounding of that I found fascinating. Uh, and I encourage people to, to look at your columns about this, but that, that while we were all concerned about how much information goes out through social or, or through new platforms, um, in truth, the gatekeeper here had to be that kind of traditional path of the traditional reporter figuring out whether these, these were really facts. Was there something to the story or not? Yeah, and if you ask Yale's friends at Facebook about the 2016 election, they'll say the mainstream media is blaming them, 
for what were really the New York Times and CNN's flaws. And that's not totally false. Yeah. I like that you think I still have friends at Facebook, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I was using the word broadly. <laughs> but but your, your experience there um, in the time that you were at Facebook, your experience really, I think, clarified for you what the limitations were, the systemic limitations of trying to say, oh, we are going to provide greater integrity. We are going to provide greater fact checking. We are going to police this better. Um, Give us sort of that outline of what what's the problem here? So uh, I wouldn't say that there was ever, that I saw anyway, a sincere effort to actually say, we are going to do this better. The effort was, what can we do to, I mean, yes, what can we do to make sure we fix this, this vulnerability that foreigners can buy and, and let me be clear, political ads is not the most important thing in social media, but the reason why we talk about it so much is it is one area that A, should be easy to regulate, B, where the rules being broken that in your face, like by so many actors should be not only visible, but it's just an area that shows you where a company will or will not draw the line. And so I'm gonna use that example of, Yes, they fix certain things about how you can buy ads and how you need to be verified, but they didn't fix any of the true systemic issues of how their platform is monetized, how, and, and let's be really clear, I don't blame Facebook for all of it. Um, first of all, they're not actually breaking the law, and so it would be ridiculous for for us to all expect them to suddenly find their better angels and put society over their fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. They are a business. Uh, I, yeah, they're a business. I have some disagreements, strong disagreements with their core value proposition that connecting the world is just the best thing ever and there should be no rules around it. But it's really incumbent on, on governments to also figure out what are the rules of the road without imposing any sort of restrictions on actual speech, but what are the rules in terms of how do you have to report on political advertising? What are the same rules that apply in TV and print and media? Why don't they apply online? How do you govern around not what a politician says on your platform, but on how your targeting tools allows that politician to target vulnerable communities with it. It's, it's all of these different tools as opposed to them having their actual being arbiters of truth. So I just want to be really clear, the fact checking part of it's not actually the thing that I think US government should necessarily be regulating. It's, it's the algorithms, the tools, the black box of no transparency into how certain things are being amplified or being targeted. That's the real problem. Um, but we did put, even when I was there, I mean, we put in some interesting measures. We created this ad library, which was called the ad archive at the time. But honestly, like you have to be a pretty strong academic with pretty strong skills or journalists to be able to really mine through that ad library and make any sense of it. It doesn't actually tell you who actually paid for the ad. Anybody can write paid for by, like they don't even verify that disclaimer. So there's some very, band, long story short, there's some very band-aid solutions, but the real issue for many of us who care about this is a business model that continues to exploit our human behavioral data to keep us engaged, to target us with certain information. They use the same tools that they target us with Adidas versus Nike ads to target us with political speech. And I just the don't thought. think it's healthy yeah. for a healthy information ecosystem. Yeah, I, I see your reaction, Ben. You're, there's nodding in some places. One of the places I thought you might set off some alarm bells is the use of the word government and observation. What's, what's your perception of that? Oh, I, I, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to. Uh, <laughs> wasn't trying to like make faces at Yale. Um, uh, the I know. I think. I mean, I basically think that's right. That like the only real way that societies ultimately deal with giant companies that operating by no rules or to make rules, and that you know Congress is the sort of appropriate place for that to happen. We do not have like the most clear sight. Obviously, when it's not the most functional institution in this country, but um, 
I do think that actually you're seeing this happen in other countries and will probably like what often happens with regulation on these digital companies is that they basically get imported from Europe. Um, in this case, also from Australia. And, and I think there's sort of, I mean, it's interesting because some of it is about the issues we're talking about. A lot of it's about competition, which bears, I think, indirectly on these questions about kind of algorithmic transparency and about, you know, what point do you get liability for something that maybe you're not liable that somebody posted it on your site, but when you distribute it to a hundred million people, maybe you become liable for it. And I think they're you know, fairly, and I think the thing is that the tech companies like to talk about this, like they're just like too complicated to regulate. Like there's some sort of magical different kind of industry than automobiles or, you know, or food processing plants. And that like, they're just like, what they do is too complicated for anybody to understand. It isn't really that complicated, I think. And most people just interact with them normally. And one of the really interesting things in Australia that's happening right now, I think it's one of the most interesting stories about this. You know, they just put this kind of like 73 year old guy who has worked on um, the regulation of Australian railroads and ports for his whole career, like a really old school competition regulator in charge of the process around Google and Facebook. And he's approached it in this like unbelievably simple way where he's like, well, if there were seven search engines, let's just like pretend that like, uh, that like Google is a port and there's only one port. And so, and they're overcharging ships. And like, if there were seven ports, how would you price the, you know, what would a ship have to pay to be in the port if there was a comp competitive situation, which is apparently how you do regulations in Australia. And so has just been totally freaking out Facebook and Google by essentially saying, we're just going to kind of model a market and impose that on you and force you to pay news publishers as though there were several competing social networks. Like it's very different from how the U S approaches antitrust regulation, but also I do think one of the things that in various ways has become clear, you know, including from the Russians and Chinese is that these governments really do control the internet in their countries and can do whatever they want. And I think, Europe's moving not kind impossible. of slowly. It's not but, impossible. Yeah. Can I just build on one thing Ben said really, really quickly? I mean, he, he nailed it on the head when he said it's not this complicated. Like I have, of all the things I've worked on, and I spent the first half of my career like in the counter extremism national security world. This conversation is the most toxic polarizing conversation when it comes to what should government's role be. And it gets way over complicated, which benefits the Silicon Valley to make it so complicated. It's too hard. You're never going to be able to figure it out. It, it does. I agree with Ben. It doesn't have to be that hard. And, and for me, I, I don't really wade into the antitrust issues or they're, antitrust experts who are smarter than I am on that issue, but just at the core of it is the idea that there is one industry in this nation who bears zero responsibility for any of the consequences of the products they build and the tools that they are providing people because there is a law that grants them immunity from any responsibility. It, it's, it's that we have to get to a point. I think that's why so many people are so angry. I would be less angry at Facebook if they made mistakes, if there was some sort of check and balance. It's the fact that there is zero accountability and they get to just throw their hands up and go, oh, well, sorry, we'll do better next time. That's what's infuriating. The rest of us have some sort of accountability baked into our work and into to the way we operate in the world. Yeah, what? and they, the answer is always this stuff is so complicated and abstract that you can't understand it. If, you know, we'd love to ban Alex Jones, but if we banned Alex Jones, it would have this waterfall of complex effects that you can never understand. And then, like, people yell at them a little louder and they ban Alex Jones and it's fine. Like, you know, they keep drawing these lines, getting pushed over them, drawing a new line, getting pushed over them, but they always speak in the language of kind of principles and systems and but constantly changed the, but, 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 but are just constantly, they've been, you know, basically in this sort of panicked retreat for two years, but at every moment explaining their newest retreat in terms of eternal principles, like it's just totally bizarre. Um, one of the things that has come up, particularly in, in recent months is the discussion about section 230 and what that would or wouldn't mean for the information that's exchanged as media. Yeah, well, if you would just, Give us a 30,000 foot view of what, what that would do. I'll give the most plain version I can possibly think of of what section 230 is. It's kind of what I was alluding to in my responsibility comment. Um, you know, it's written in 1996. It, the thing that's, the unfortunate thing is it's trying to accomplish two things at the same time. On the one hand, it's 
gives immunity from responsibility for third party content, meaning if you are deemed a neutral intermediary, then you don't bear responsibility for what somebody posts using your service. But then on the same time, it also provides them immunity to moderate content as they see fit. And the problem here is this, this debate has been politicized in a way that has made the real smart conversations around what to do about 230 kind of fall through the cracks. Um, you've seen a few hearings recently, you heard President Trump did an executive order about 230. Putting all the political sort of BS and grandstanding aside, at the end of the day, we have something that was written in 1996 before these platforms even existed. And it considered all inter internet companies that were in this business as some sort of neutral intermediary, like the pipes, right? So if there's a software that I'm using to build a website, should I be responsible for what I put on that website or should the software company? In that case, Section 230 makes sense. I should be responsible, not the company, not Squarespace. But what doesn't make sense in 2020 is that these companies are not just neutral interme intermediaries. And the way I would approach it is not about striking down 230. It's not about getting rid of it. It's not even about necessarily changing it. It's about changing the definition of who qualifies for it. Because in my opinion, the first part, not the freedom to moderate content, but the first part of bearing no responsibility, if your company is using algorithms to decide what content is being amplified and boosted, is using recommendation engines to decide what they are steering you to, who they're connecting, what groups they're recommending to you, and offering targeting tools so that you can decide how exactly you want to target messages to particular communities, those are the tools that you should be responsible for. And that does not make you just this pipes neutral intermediary. I'd like to rethink the definitions of who classifies for that and then figure out what does the landscape look around that? Like how do we make transparency around your recommendation engines baked into what we would define responsibility for? So I know that was sort of, it was long, but it was also very high level, um, but that's how I look at it. Yeah, we were a little disappointed when you said you were going to give us the clean answer, because I guess there was probably something that sounded like it would be something more salacious than that. Um, and, and I, but what you were saying really does go to a point that somebody in our audience is asking, what would, would satisfy the interests of both Dems and Republicans who are divided on how to regulate? Um, to that point, then, in what you're hearing from Yale, uh, it, is, this, is this, because I think it's hard enough to get Mark Zuckerberg to acknowledge what his company is and isn't doing so far. Uh, how does that play through the political lens? You know, I mean, I think you there, I think you could, it, it's just, I think it's actually a bit hard to know whether this Congress is going to be the usual dysfunctional mess or whether there's path for some bipartisan legislation. I mean, I think if you listen really hard to what Republicans and what Democrats say on this, there are slivers of something that you could put into some kind of legislation around transparency. I mean, I think w these hearings often what happens is this, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's up there and, or Jack Dorsey is and somebody is like, did you see this tweet? Can you help me with this tweet? Like it's totally useless. But, um, but I think these the sort of questions around like making these companies more transparent, more and, and liable for, certain kinds of actions. It doesn't seem totally impossible that, that that would happen. And meanwhile, I think one of the places that you could really see continuity from a Trump to a Biden administration is antitrust. Mm -hmm. And the, a lot of that stuff is already underway. Um, and I think poses a real threat to these companies. I mean, not to put them out of business, but to split them into you know other viable companies. Um, I want to return to our audience asking questions uh, about uh, a little bit broad, more broadly uh, around the kind of information and misinformation that has floated through this election cycle. Can panelists share some perspective on fake news around coronavirus and the political no, I can never say this, you know, that politics I thing <laughs> of the impact on the election? Can you talk about that distribution? that distribution of coronavirus information or just the, the misleading around that? 
Um, I'll just take a quick crack at it. I'm, I don't know if Ben follows this a little more closely than I do. Um, so part of the issue with with COVID misinformation and disinformation, and, and I know that this is a sophisticated audience. I'll just say really quickly, the reason why I use both of those words is misinformation is not necessarily with an intent to purposely dis mislead. Misinformation can just be a mistake. It can be spreading something that's not totally true and you didn't realize. I mean, there's so many ways mis and then disinformation is intentional. It is an intentional way. I mean, it's a lie, um, but obviously we're seeing with COVID that the situation we have now with the spread of mis and disinformation is actually costing lives. And uh, I think there's a few different things at play. One of the things at play is we had, especially with Facebook, a company that made it crystal clear they wouldn't fact check politicians. And then suddenly this situation came up and it was like, well, what are we going to do? Because at the end of the day, the most, the information that people are most likely to trust is going to come from their elites. It's going to come from the New York Times. It's going to come from the president. It's going to come from the politicians they believe in. You know, it is. And, and so first one issue is Facebook having to decide whether or not they're not fact-checking politicians was going to apply to COVID. And it took them a while to make that decision. Slapping on a label that doesn't really say anything about the veracity of the actual post. It's it's not. a post out of the barn thing, isn't it? I mean, it's it's the information that's just out there. Is it enough to, to stick a label on? What does that do? What does that change? So yeah, when, you, when you just stick a label on with no actual information around it and, and then expect users to click on it and click through to a separate area to go find more information, in my opinion, that's not helping. There are little, there are things they could do. They could also, I don't expect Facebook and Twitter this late in the game to be able to catch every piece of mis and disinformation around COVID. It's just, they have had such an unhealthy system for so long. I don't expect that, but they could flood the zone with good information as opposed to expecting me to click through and go seek it on my own. They could make sure that every post after somebody who spreads misinformation is good information. And there are definitely times like with the pandemic video that they could have stopped it much earlier on and had too much internal debate about whether or not that would chip away at their power and their position with certain political players. So some of it, I do blame them for some of it. It's we've allowed this, we've allowed them to operate like this for so long. There was no way they were going to suddenly turn it off. They made a valiant effort to combat COVID disinformation, but clearly, um, I mean, I'll pass this over to Ben. I don't follow the COVID yeah, actually, as closely. I think I disagree a little with you here, just in that I think the contrast between how they dealt with COVID and misinformation and disinformation and stuff around politics is pretty instructive. Like, <clears throat> again, right, they, they made lots of mistakes. There was a lot of like journalists sort of playing hall monitor for them and then then knocking something down after it had been shown to them. But they, I mean, they deleted, I mean, I was sort of following some local stuff and they really were pretty aggressive about deleting groups that were focused on sharing COVID misinformation. And they did, you know, they deleted that video after maybe 12 or 24 hours rather than zero hours and they should have moved faster. But I think actually like COVID was this place where people like Mark Zuckerberg felt pretty comfortable saying, well, look, like this is the public, the public health experts say we're going to defer to them and we're going to delete this stuff in a way that is just not ever going to be true of politics. And even when, and, and of political actors, it also though, I mean, I don't, it's not, it's not centrally a Facebook problem when the World Health Organization and the CDC put out dis, uh, misinformation. And when the president of the United States then spreads disinformation, like, those are huge political problems for us broad as citizens that fa that are not Facebook's fault, like not Facebook's fault that the head of the, the CDC and the WHO were telling people not to wear masks because they were afraid of run on masks. And there were these huge chat, like huge missteps around communications from the people who Facebook and Twitter needed to be like relying on to decide what to delete. And I think a lot of that actually sort of righted it itself. And I think they're, again, like doing an okay job, moving too slowly, Ag agree, like the whole ecosystem is set up for them to fail at this and lots of garbage is continuing to spread. But I think they've broadly done an okay job at it. Um, and well, certainly like that. wildly better. I fully, agree. I said, we don't disagree. I fully agree with yeah. that. And, and again, we, you know, it does extend beyond, I mean, we, 
for obvious reasons, we're talking a lot about Facebook, but I mean, now we're in, into, you know, okay, maybe if, if there's, if they, these players feel that there's too much restriction for them on Facebook and Twitter, now they're off to parlor where that, that bubble of communication where they can continue to, to echo chamber themselves on subjects that will just endorse and increase false information, not policed at all. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, I mean, it's an, it's a different situation. And I, I think, it, you know, it's interesting. I mean, WhatsApp groups are another place that people can, that aren't really monitored, a little, maybe a little, but basically anything can spread, as is, you know, the telephone. There are like, you know, there, there is a sort of set of channels where people, I mean, I think the difference, although it could change again, is you know what you're going for, par why you're going to Parler. You're not getting, you're not going to go on to Parler and accidentally be recommended down a rabbit hole that leads you toward right-wing politics. Like that's why you're there. Um, and I think the, one of the big problems with Facebook and with YouTube in particular is this kind of radicalization issue. Again, like not that, I mean, there's some like human nature. Like it's not, again, like there's lots of reasons that people are gonna continue to like lie and believe lies and do bad things. But these massive platforms that everybody is in and that misinformation, disinformation are getting spread to people who like kind of weren't looking for it. Like if you go to Parler, like that's why you're there. Of course you're gonna get misinformation. Like, like it's literally why you signed up. So that's such a key point. If I can just say one quick thing here, people often say, well, why are you criticizing Facebook and not Fox News? And, and by the way, I can criticize one that doesn't mean I don't criticize the other. But I always say, well, okay, but at least if I turn on MSNBC or I turn on Fox News, I am turning on a channel that I know the leaning, I know what I'm going there for, I know sort of which bubble I'm going into. Whereas Facebook, I mean, really, you have all types on Facebook and they continue to tell us that it's all about connecting us in a meaningful conversations. So to Ben's point, unlike when you go on Parler or when you turn on Fox or MSNBC, you, you're not necessarily going with this idea of, I am going to be drawn down just this one particular rabbit hole of information. Um, and so there's also just a disingenuous marketing by Mark Zuckerberg of what Facebook truly is. And it's not just a place for kittens and baby pictures. Um, I, I, you know, sometimes I think about right. your identity, Yale, that, that you're, you know, you have worked with people on extremism. You worked to, to stop the spread of, of extremism. And I think, well, how is that related to what's happening in social media platforms? But actually, it's quite the same, isn't it? It is. It's so, so it's interesting. This is kind of the whole thesis of the talk that I gave was that, and this is not an illegal thing. This is a societal issue. I mean, again, I don't blame Facebook for everything that's wrong in the world, but I do blame them for sort of profiting off of exacerbating a lot of it. Um, the, the problem with social media companies, first of all, anybody can be an expert. Anybody like there's, it's the, the whole death of expertise. Anybody who knows how to game an algorithm, as long as you have tons of likes and shares, you somehow look credible. The fact that there's no friction, there's no pause. There's no way to even slow down for a second and to stop and think about your reaction to something. And so part of the whole countering extremism work that I did for so long was this hearts and minds type work, right? And unfortunately, it's very hard to do online because hearts and minds work is really about, I mean, we don't do face-to-face -face anymore during COVID days, but it's about conversations with people. It's about me listening to you more than talking. It's about me trying to hear your perspective and then finding, even if we disagree, some sort of common goal that we both have and building on that. In the way social media is constructed and monetized, it is next to impossible for that to happen when it's, there's no way to listen. Like listening isn't built into this fast paced frictionless clickbait wins. I mean, even and Ben can talk to this more than I can, but even the media has had to adjust to, well, how do I make sure that my title will get play on Facebook and therefore wonky fact-based titles are not going to work on Facebook. So even the media starts to get more and more like salacious with their titles and more, it's all this engagement, engagement, engagement. And it's, it re reflects back, I would say. I mean, I think that we then take that and use it in, you know, legacy media channels and say, okay, 
what works in social media is t- 10, you know, 10 cats that have killed their masters or whatever. Uh, we, we've gone to all these click, we go to a clickbait thinking, not only in what's actually appearing in social media, but what then comes back to the legacy media and becomes the way we produce our content, Ben. I mean, there is a fondness. You blame the cats. <laughs> yeah, um, he did. I mean, BuzzFeed, you can't blame the cats, right? Yeah. The cats, are, the cats are totally, are totally yeah. innocent in this. Um, I mean, I do think there was sort of a way of thinking about content, essentially, that like taught people that, that, that got adapted to political, you know, propaganda, essentially, of all sorts, true, false, left, right. Um, you know, that was sort of about hacking these social networks and, and, and people's attention. Um, yeah, I think I do think basically sort of as you said, like the, the sort of legacy media, it took a while to sort of find its feet in that ecosystem, but I think to some degree has. Yeah, and we've come to practice it, which is its own, carries its own dangers, right? We, if we go down that path, then we are falling victim to the same, you know, this is how we're gonna get our audience, cat pictures. On the day that a cat picture is next to your byline in the New York Times, I'm going to be done. But you know, <laughs> this this is what we've learned is oh, the audience likes that. It is still a business. We are still involved in trying to draw audience into our business. And the audience always liked that. Newspapers had comics. The New York Times has a restaurant section and an auto section. I, I, I think that like I sort of think it's a the notion that what's new is that the media wants to entertain people and engage them and sell things. It's like, that's not, none of that is new. I do think that like what's new is this, is these huge global networks and their structure and how stuff spreads around them. And, and, you know, the notion like the new, you know, the New York post was publishing crazy, badly sourced stories long before Facebook was a glint in Mark Zuckerberg's eye. And, 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 you know, the big television networks were, telling, saying things they knew to be false about Vietnam, right? Like, like I think there's like a, uh, there's sort of, sometimes there's sort of a revisionism that the media used to be great and now it's terrible. It was always pretty terrible. So like, and I do, but, but the new, the, new, the thing that is new, I do think really is, is the sort of scale of, of these networks and, and the way content spreads. And um, the relationship to other countries and cultures, and we are speaking to an international audience here today. Um, can you speak to that? That, that this, this globalization of information, I think also carries some risks in how, how, how ideas spread, how views spread as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say like risks and real benefits. I mean, there is this like global, I mean, and really largely enabled by these social networks that we're, you know, mostly kind of denouncing here. Like there's this incredible kind of global conversation around things like human rights that never existed before. If you're a journalist writing a story about Iraq and you have made something up, there are Iraqis on Twitter who will call you on it, which was not true during the Iraq war. I mean, there's a lot of massive benefits to that. And I think it has weakened the power of like these Western institutions to make up stories about the rest of the world and publish them, which was like a large part of what they did for hundreds of years. And so I think I'm mostly on the side, I I think it's that kind of globalization has basically been a positive force for both media and social media. I mean, you know, obviously you don't want Russian propaganda getting pumped down into your Facebook feed. Oh, but I think that, but I, I think that, and I don't know if Yale agrees with this, that that was always kind of an overstated story in terms of its actual impact on any human beings. So I think similar to what Ben's saying, I mean, the problem is everyone wants you to say it's all good or it's all bad. And, yeah. and if either of those answers were correct, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. The reason it's so complicated is because it's not all good or all bad. Otherwise we would have solved it by now. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, social media and the global scale of it and the ability for people all over the world to chime in on conversations and on issues is amazing. And and there's some really amazing things that have happened on the global stage as a result, including, you know, conversations around climate change, human rights, all the things that Ben is saying. Um, But you can have all that and still recognize that there's a real dark side as well. And, And I think one, two of the issues on the global, since I know that, I mean, this is also, you guys attract global diplomats and that's what Meridian is, is one of your big audiences is, you know, part of it though, is it does lose all local 
nuance and realities. And what I mean by that is I'll give a quick example when I was at Facebook and I was trying to put together this sort of voter suppression plan for political advertising. Um, the very first question all the seniors asked was, well, how does that scale? And this was right ahead of our 2018 midterms, which should have been a huge test after 2016. And I like, well, it might not scale. Every election in the world has different political realities. Every, you know, what, what goes on in the US is not gonna be the same as what goes on in France's election or in the Ukraine. And, and it was constantly like, well, that doesn't scale globally. You're right, it doesn't. And so on the one hand, there's a huge benefit to, I agree, I don't think the media was ever perfect. I think knocking down some of the traditional gatekeepers overall is a good thing. I think we have to find a healthier balance between the two though, because right now, whatever solution you come up with, it, it loses all local and, and uh, all local and political nuance. We're trying to have one solution for the entire world. And that is why, and then secondly, I'll say really quickly, um, whether or not Russia's influence was overplayed, at the end of the day, a platform like Facebook does give Russia the upper hand in a much cheaper version of information warfare. It doesn't involve drones and tanks and costly things, and it lets Russia play way above its weight because it knows how to use these tools. And, and you can watch Yuri Bezmenov, I think that was his name, the KGB defector in the 80s, giving an interview to Canadian TV saying exactly what they're going to do to the US and how it'll take a few decades to do so. It's always been about propaganda and information warfare, but these social media platforms are providing very cheap tools now for some of these players to pull it off. So those are two different answers, but there are serious global ramifications and um, any ability to distill local nuance or local realities. I mean, why didn't Facebook even realize what was going on in Myanmar? Because everything is like one answer for the whole world, as opposed to living up to your responsibility of being a huge information provider in Myanmar. Yeah, well, right? I think yeah. that, that this is a recurring theme in, in journalism, right? But maybe it's in human nature. We look to this, we need a good and a bad. We need a right and a wrong. We need a left and a right. We need clarity. We want something clear, clearly defined when really it's the nuances that we should be looking for. Um, I was looking to see if there were other questions in our, our chat. Um, and this is one. Where do we go from here to improve civic discourse? What, what is next for that? Ben, I'll let you start there. And that's a really hard question. And I, I wish I had a better answer. I mean, I don't think there's some shortcut. I, I think, I mean, in my sort of like actual experience that the kind of the place where that can happen is locally, not uh, like they're just the sort of bubble of national politics is so poisonous and of cable news. And I don't really think there's some way to make cable news non-toxic. Like just, it's just not in the sort of, you know, can you make ESPN less about competition. Like, I just don't think it's, I just think these sort of the genre and the formats just sort of contain that. Um, and so I think, but I think that when you get out of that bubble and you're writing about something that's closer to people about, you know, particularly local news about kind of trade reporting and beat reporting, you really don't see the same dynamics. You don't see people denying stories that are true and claiming they're fake news, or maybe you see it, but there's no real audience for it. Um, and I think, you know, if you, you know, if you see, if you read an expose about sexual abuse in a school, you're not going to see the principal say, this is fake news and we're going to ignore it. It just doesn't happen. And, and so I guess my own instinct is that you just, you, that like those, there are, there are much less toxic spaces than national politics and that like the sort of, whatever kind of improvements are going to happen are going to happen there. Gail, what uh, do we do to make things better? I mean, I wish also that I had the perfect answer. I don't, but I do think that um, a few things that we could do. One is just so simple and so hard at the same time. And it is that to improve civil discourse, we have to push ourselves to engage with people who aren't like-minded. And this is where the social media effect bothers, concerns me because social media should, it, just its concept alone should be such a great tool to help you see more perspectives and engage with people who aren't like-minded. But because of the way sort of the algorithms draw you down certain holes, it, it seems to be doing the opposite. 
So one is like, I don't know how to convince everybody in America to get off social media and go engage with people who aren't like-minded. We don't gather around and the- it's tried, but it uh, but keeps coming back. Yeah, um, so that's one. Obviously, media literacy has got to be a higher priority um, in schools. In I mean, there is a personal sort of literacy and responsibility side to it, but I will keep going back to, I would also like to see some sort of, I mean, there are actual externalities in the way these social media companies have monetized their platforms that are affecting the way people engage with each other. And whether it's the effect on mental health, whether it's the effect on teenage girls' self-esteem, whether it's the effect on political discourse, all of these things are byproducts of the way they're platform tools work and are monetized. Mm -hmm. So I don't think all the responsibility is 100% on us as individuals. I think it's, it's sort of a whole of society approach here. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all about trust. And that's what civil discourse is about. It's about building trust with people. And that's going to take a lot of work in government. It's going to take a lot of work in media. Um, but I just, the way social media right now purposely drives us into different sort of, it's the engagement model again, I don't wanna give the whole attention economy speech, but I do think it's very detrimental to civil discourse. Good perspective from both of you. Appreciate both of you being with us in this hour as well to our audience. I know that a lot of you are looking in on us from all around the world and certainly in this country as well. And we appreciate your following and your care for this. These are trying times for journalists, for diplomats, for people who are concerned about civil society at large. And we remain committed to bring facts, information, full information and detail to audiences. We appreciate all of you who are in support of that goal as well. There are some 56, I think, if my count is right, days to a new administration here in Washington. We do anticipate a lot of things being ordered and a lot of things to watch and a lot of opportunities as well to bring conversations like this forward. So we thank you for participating in that. We appreciate the Meridian Global Journalism Initiative for convening these important conversations and we thank you all for joining us.